Welcome to Smart Money, brought to you by Daily Investor, South Africa's fastest growing investment publication. I'm Alicia Segum, and we're joined by Michael Jordan today, one of South Africa's best known business leaders and former CEO of FNB, who was, of course, behind the bank's tremendous success between 2004 and 2013. Since then, Jordan's founded Montgray Capital, a private equity firm that invests in disruptive technologies and disruptive business models. He's a partner in 25 ventures, including Bank Zero, Rain, Vala, and Numerical. So, Michael, thanks so much for your time today, where we're going to be focusing on life after banking for Michael Jordan as a venture capitalist and how you go about picking companies to invest in to help them grow. So right at the top, the question is twofold, right? What are the similarities and differences between running a large bank and a venture capital fund? And how has your experience as a big bank CEO helped you in that venture capital space? Hi, Alicia. Thanks for having me. Um, The similarities between banking and venture capital is that it's all about risk and return, but that's where it stops. So apart from size, you know, in FNB there was more than 30,000 employees and what I do now, I essentially do on my own, I'm a one-man show. So apart from size, the decisions that you have to make are vastly different. In banking, if you make two mistakes out of a hundred in your lending, that wipes out your margin. And if you make one mistake in ten, that wipes out your capital and you don't have a bank anymore. Now, in venture capital, it's the exact opposite. If you have 10 investments, you can expect five of them to not make it. You're going to make at least five out of 10 mistakes, but one or two out of those investments are hopefully going to return more than 10 times your money each. And that is why the portfolio then pays for itself. So vastly different risk and return profiles. And I suppose as a conservative banker, you need to learn how to make some mistakes. Yeah, well, I was perusing your uh, Twitter feed not so long ago, and I came across a tweet, Michael, that said, Michael, I have deals to make your head spin. They're all doable. Send me your details so I can send you a list so you can pick and kiss. It's got to be challenging picking winners when you're flooded with presentations from founders who are convinced that their business is the next big thing. So what's your investment strategy when it comes to selecting the companies you put your money into? Yes, Alicia, you're so right. It's challenging. As Warren Buffett once put it in the context of insurance, he said, if you misprice risk, the world will find you. And so it is if you have a little bit of capital to invest in startups. There really is a big need out there in South Africa. I have to admit that what I found too difficult was investing at the idea only stage. There are just too many people who have great ideas, probably overvalue those ideas and haven't started implementing it yet. For me in venture capital, the sweet spot came when I backed entrepreneurs or businesses that already had some form of market traction, which meant you know, customers were, you know, enjoying the product or service. And then you could use the capital to help growth rather than to just prove the concept. So that's my basic filter. Have you got market traction? Yeah, but you've got to admit, right, that conviction of idea is a powerful thing. You know it all too well. Rain is showing growth, but it's also been getting its fair share of criticism, right? So what grounds your belief that you can take on a Vodacom and an MTN when you've got the likes of Salsi and Telcom battling against that kind of muscle? Yes, the rain story is probably quite an instructive one for people who want to compete um, in a market where you have two very large players already um, and others that uh, have really been around for 10 or 15 or even longer. And the point there is that you can't take them on at their own game using the rules that they've established for the industry. So RAIN had to be different. And I'll give you a couple of examples. First of all, RAIN is a data only player. It didn't even bother to go with voice and SMS because you can do all of that on WhatsApp now. It didn't go on 3G and 2G. It immediately went for 4G and 5G. It doesn't sell in the traditional method. So there aren't RAIN stores in every supermarket or or mall in South Africa, but it sells online and directly to customers. And as we speak, it is not yet nationwide. So it could focus on specific areas um, to help people get Wi-Fi in their homes. So the business model 
is fundamentally different to the business models of the other players. It is a lower cost business model and therefore it can also be price competitive. And same applies to Bank Zero, right? Once again, you're taking on very large and well-funded players in an established industry, the incumbents, they call them. But, uh, you know, in this instance as well, not being hamstrung by legacy infrastructure, perhaps your biggest advantage if you are going to launch a new digital bank that's going to be a worthy contender. Yes, so the Bank Zero story is obviously close to my heart. Um, I'd say the, the real differentiator, as it actually is with uh, all the startups that succeed, is people and the team there. So it's an incredible founding team led by Yatin Narsi. Uh, they have uh, rolled up their sleeves to go from strategy to implementation. The two market um, issues that Bank Zero addresses is, first of all, the very high fees that South Africans pay, and particularly the business segment, which is neglected. And then secondly, the role of technology. Um, you don't have to build a new startup based on the old technology that most of the incumbent banks in the world use, but you can build a modern bank based on modern systems with modern cyber defense and at a very low cost, particularly if you rely on proven open source technologies. So the business model there of being a mobile and a card driven bank that is free and it is open not just for individuals and businesses, we believe is the long term model that will win in the banking industry. Michael, when people listen to you, you know, when they listen to your business ideas, how you've uh, you know, ma managed to see them take flight, when they listen to your optimism, many say, yeah, but he speaks from a position of capital. Access to capital will breed success. So, of course, the companies he's involved in are going to be successful. His home base is Stellenbosch. I'm sure, you know, you've heard it all before. But where you work closely with the founders of the businesses you back, giving you insight into what sees these businesses grow, what advice do you have for startups to optimize their chances of success despite the constraints and some of the harsh realities they face on the South African ground? So, Alicia, while I, as a venture capitalist, is in the business of providing capital to these startups, the message I would give to you and to most of them is don't overvalue capital. Having too much capital can actually be quite a bad thing for business because then you're not forced to innovate and to say, how can I do it differently? How can I do it cheaply? There's something to be said for lean innovation. And these days it's possible to start a business with very few people, to outsource as much as possible, um, to not have to buy your own hardware, you can put it in the cloud and there are a lot of free services available. So the first one I would say is don't over rely on capital. Um, the second one is to get to the market quickly. You know, people take too long. They want to do things like feasibility studies and sign NDAs and so on. Get out in the market and learn what customers say and adapt. Um, from my side, the lessons I've learned uh, or, or know have had tried to apply is um, diversification. Um, I mentioned early how many of your investments in venture capital can go wrong. So it's important that you have a portfolio of 10 or ideally 20 different counters that are unrelated. And then the final thing I'll say that, that I think the value that is uh, most underappreciated is the ability to get things done. Um, in South Africa, um, in general, we, we all kind of know what the problems are um, and we think and talk about them too much. So the founders that win, the founding teams and the startups that win are the ones that get out there and simply get things done, even if it involves uh, crawling over gr broken glass. Yeah, because we talk about your successes, right? But the recent FTX debacle shows that even the best venture capital firms like Sakaya Capital are never too old to learn. What's the biggest lesson you've learned along the way? Well, the, the two things. Um, the one is, again, diversification. So there are going to be mistakes. And you must make sure that those mistakes don't kill you. So, so if you have something like an FTX happen in your portfolio, um, Sequoia won't go under because they've got a great number of other investments. But the second one is people. It always comes down to people. It's not the idea, it's not the execution, or it is, but you can't divorce it from the people who run the business. So the most important thing is actually to have the intuition or to be able to do the checks on the founding teams. Because nothing is going to work as easily as planned. Things are going to go wrong. And then it's up to that team to actually fix it. So where's your intuition, Michael, taking you next? Where are you seeing opportunity for investment? And to what extent are you putting more skin in the game? 
So, so Alicia, uh, quite sadly, I, I don't have uh, any more capital. I'm fully invested with my 25 or so company. So I, I really am just trying to give support to them. But um, I think the world is an incredibly exciting place and the amount of new technologies that are coming to the fore and the amount of new business models that they allow, whether that's AI or alternative power or 3D printing or uh, you know, biotechnology, it, it really, really is exceptionally exciting. So um, my message to everybody out there, to, to all your listeners, is just lean into all these changes. You know, you can be worried about, let's say, AI and that it can take jobs. But the jobs that are going to be survival, are the people who know how to use those tools. So there's, I'm a techno optimist. I think there's a lot of potential for applying a lot of these technologies in South Africa. The wonderful thing about South Africa is we have problems to solve. And I do believe that entrepreneurs are best positioned to solve them for South Africa. Having said that, Michael, is it taking longer than you thought it would to reap return on your investments? Um, Alicia, everything takes too long. I'm a very impatient person. I want everything to have happened yesterday. The thing about venture capital is that you are forced to hold them long term. They're illiquid investments, right? They're um, not like the ones you have on the stock exchange that you can exit tomorrow if you need the cash or you lose faith. That means you need to be really careful to make these decisions because you are married to these teams uh, for the longer term. So yes, it takes too long, but that's also a positive because you're forced to go through the tough times. You can't panic and get out of it. And there's actually proof that the type of investments that you keep for the long run, whether it's wine or art or long-term venture capital or private equity, outperform the liquid markets. So that too excites me. So what are you saying to potential investors who are holding capital back and saying the lights aren't even on in South Africa? So South Africa is most certainly not open for business and reaping any return on investment is going to be a risky bet, not only because of all the structural challenges, but because of the inequality divide that's going to inevitably widen as a result, shrinking the purchasing power of the marketplace these businesses are catering to. You know, when investment decisions are made, we think that we do them very rationally. We use spreadsheets and we weigh the different factors and we do analyses. But what people um, underestimate is the role of emotions, you know, and this good old greed and fear. Um, are they making investment because of greed or out of fear? What I can tell you is that you must put, try to put your emotions aside um, and actually invest when everyone else um, is fearful. I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, preaching anything new here. And, but that is a situation where South Africa finds itself in right now. There's low levels of confidence, you know, investor sentiment isn't great. Uh, what I'm telling you is that those are actually the best times to invest. And the nice thing about venture capital is not just about investment, it's also about solving problems. I need to tell you that I get my kick probably in the first instance about the problem being solved sustainably. And if you do that well enough, then the investment returns will come in any event. So rather than say the power isn't on, Look at all the options that are available now with new technology to produce power at a lower cost than is available. And so we can run through all of South Africa's problems, but there are solutions out there quite often involving new technologies and most certainly involving entrepreneurs. Michael, thanks so much for joining us on Smart Money today and sharing a few perspectives from a venture capitalist point of view. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, 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 oh,